Hi, and welcome to Ran in Focus, a podcast brought to you by the Radicalization Awareness Network, Ran Practitioners. I'm Maya Rosa, and today I'll be having a discussion with frontline practitioners and experts about the huge changes in and challenges to our working environment in recent times. With the COVID-19 crisis, the emergence of new and ever more violent extremist threats, the continuing evolution and adoption of digital technology, and the increasing spread of disinformation and conspiracy narratives, and not to mention the tragic events unfolding in the Ukraine, it can feel like the world is in a perpetual state of flux, I guess you could say, and the threats we face are multiplying. So let me introduce you to my wonderful guests. Uh, my first guest is Angela Antonova from the Bulgarian Association of Social Workers and the co-leader of RAN Families, Communities and Social Care Working Group. And my second guest is uh, Kelly Simcock, and she is a PCV consultant and advisor to the Foundation for Peace in Manchester and a former chair of the RAN Youth Families and Communities Working Group. And my third and final guest is Jean-Philippe Fons from the French Department for Education and the co-leader of RAN Youth and Education Working Group. So Angela, just let me let me turn to you first. Just how much has the threat of, of violent extremism changed in, in recent times in terms of like types and, and like the sheer amount of ideologies and groups that we are now up against? There are multiple of challenges, including the race of the violent right wing, left wing, other groups, disinformation, digitalization. According to media coalition in Bulgaria, above 47% of young people are confronted with extremist content online and they are not protected in any way. Wow, 47% is a, is a big and I think kind of worrying number. And post-COVID, how isolated are some of our more like vulnerable individuals and communities in, in your experience, Kelly? And I think that now the challenge is even greater in the sense that they're even more socially isolated now in many ways, because as we know, you know, these communities of interest have moved to be much more online. Their sources of information, um, the groups that they're accessing, it's much more online. So how do we not only reach out to those people, but find those people to begin with, which I think from a, you know, from a tackling that perspective, from a practitioner's perspective, it's where to begin in terms of tackling those various different ideas and ideologies that, that young people are coming forward with. Yeah, that does seem to be like a common theme here. Um, you know, the challenges are multiplying, becoming more complex and increasingly interrelated, I guess you could say. And, and you know, it's the sheer scale and complexity of the online world that is kind of, you know, daunting for, for so many practitioners. And how are these challenges playing out from, from an educational perspective, um, Jean-Philippe? I mean, we're talking about some, some rapid change here. And even before COVID, most uh, or the vast majority of teachers didn't think that their role was to uh, see to it that kids were not exposed uh, in the virtual world to uh, extremist thoughts, to rationales, to ideologies. Um, they, they, I'm not saying they were not aware of the issues, but if they were aware of the, of the existing technology, though they didn't know exactly where things were happening, they, uh, they'd never heard about Telegram or, 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 or encrypted uh, messaging systems. Uh, but even the, if they were aware that things were happening, they thought that it was up to parents, basically, uh, to uh, make, make sure that their kids were not directly exposed to, to these programs. And surely what they thought was that all these things were, were due to be left outside of the school environment and, uh, and of the classroom. Um, so, so how do we make our way with confidence in a world that is in the world that is emerging? Uh, are we sufficiently equipped to tackle these challenges? Um, I think it's an interesting question, actually, Maya, because I do have the sense from speaking to practitioners that there are less organisations that feel equipped to tackle this issue is, is certainly what I sense. Um, and I mean, you know, th this is not notwithstanding the fact, obviously, that for us all, we've all just been hidden for two years, if you like, <laughs> as part of this pandemic, um, almost sort of tackling the immediate crises. And that includes practitioners themselves having their own challenges and within their own organisations as well to deal with, let alone uh, before before they step outside. So I think there's there's all of that in the mix. And, and do you agree with this, Angela? 
Yes, I think that there are not enough practitioners doing this work. Yes, there is higher interest of general practitioners to join the field of PVE, but my perception is that there are not enough well-trained and well-prepared PVE practitioners to deal with the new challenges arising from COVID-19 pandemic. Jean-Philippe? My, my, my answer would be... a. Uh probably biased, but I would say no. Not that not enough professionals, enough practitioners aware of these issues, of, of the things they don't know, and that's <laughs> and that's the step one. And and probably not enough resources or, or training sessions available within the framework of uh, continuous professional development of teachers or initial teacher training uh, to, to to address those issues. Right. So, so in many ways, we need more professionals and, and more practitioners to, to get involved in PCVE. And we really need to equip and resource them to do their work more effectively. And apart from, you know, just in, in education, um, do CSOs have the right resources to, to adapt to this new environment? Because, you know, I feel like the reality is that quite a few are, are struggling right now. As the attention of governments and the funding has moved away, perhaps from um, tackling extremism, and it's made for a difficult time, I think, and a bit of a bumpy road for some CSOs, some organisations, and indeed practitioners in um, in knowing where um, their efforts need to be to be targeted, if you like. I think that one of the other challenges for practitioners now is is that because of the range and the complexity of the interventions that are needed with with people because ideologies are not necessarily clear cut. You've got people who have become interested in different ideologies or different groups. It means that practitioners have not only got to have um, a good level of understanding and insight into those those subject areas, um, but also got to be multi-skilled as well often in in how they work with, uh, with these individuals. And is this something that you have found Jean-Philippe. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because the, the factors are multifaceted. So the responses have to be thought in the same way of uh, opening up the boxes and, and, and thinking in terms of cross-departmental, cross-ministerial uh, aspects. The responses have to be as complex yeah, as the issues and as the sources. That has certainly been like reflected in, I think, all of the conversations I've been having in these podcasts. You know, whether it's conspiracy narratives, disinformation, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the sheer amount of, of variability of choices, like the pluralization of, of choice, is, is very difficult to counter, I think. Where are the gaps and what kind of training or even like professional adjustments do we need to, to be thinking about? So in March, uh, we had our working group meeting on hybrid social work using digital or hybrid interventions. It's very important that uh, we as practitioners set a clear frame, a clear rules for our hybrid services. I think that practitioners need to have greater confidence now in, in almost, I would say, refocusing themselves on, on, on what they know and that they understand to be the right approaches with people. We already have the skills, the capabilities, the capacities to reach out to people. We actually have the tools to be able to do that. It's almost, this, it's just a subject matter that actually needs to be able to be, to be changed, to be tweaked, to be honed, to appeal to that particular audience. And I think there's something about building that confidence back in practitioners again, um, you know, to make the case to, to get people back into face to face settings again, but also to just try to use those tools that they already have in that online space. The skills that haven't fallen away or that have changed in terms of how we do that. It's just that the platform on which we're doing it is is slightly different. So it's clear that there are so many good practitioners out there, but but maybe we need to build confidence in practitioners to, you know, get online and, and get back out into the communities. What kind of ramifications does this have in terms of like recruitment and vocational training? In your case, obviously, you know, the focus is, is on education, Jean-Philippe. In terms, in terms of recruiting and, and training teachers, that's something we have to be, to, to concentrate on. And I, and I would say at a very early stage, I mean, the, there's, there's no need waiting for, 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 young, for young teachers to be in the context to be placed in the context of teaching experiences in the classroom at a very early stage in the university uh, curriculum, ideally, uh, we, we should address these issues. 
I feel like certainly with organizations like the Radicalization Awareness Network around, there is a collective will and there is knowledge and resources needed to tackle these challenges. Um, for me, example, I'm in Sweden. Like RAN has been an amazing um, network for me to share knowledge, but also to gain knowledge, you know. Um, is it more important now than before? Uh, and if it is, why? I think it's critically important that we're sharing our knowledge um, at the, that international level. Practitioners, policymakers, researchers, you know, none of us have all of the ideas on our in our own individual states. Um, I, I think that, you know, some brilliant ideas can and have been exchanged in these spaces and, and certainly should continue to be, is my view. And where in RAN can we turn to or, you know, look for kind of practical advice on our changing work environments? I think maybe we should keep being active and, yeah, RAN communications are doing excellent work to, to spread the word about the possibility to share and exchange knowledge on how to navigate the digital aspect of delivering their services. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the publications of the, uh, of the RAN are of, uh, of uh, great importance, uh, at least to invite professionals to dig further those, uh, in, the, in those issues and, and try to fathom the, uh, <laughs> the world of the, of the unknown unknowns uh, as far as they can, or at least make them aware of these, of these topics or these issues so they can start conversation with their, with their peers. It goes without saying that the changes to our working environments are, are many and very like multifaceted. Can I have some last words from you on how you feel the RAN Practitioners Network can, you know, really move forward most effectively and, and practically? We have to so be straight, go straight to the point. Uh, this is what has been done in, in, in such a country, in a given country. This is how it works. And here is the method you could try to replicate. Or at least if, if you don't replicate it, that, that could, uh, could act as a, as a stimulator, as an energizer. Keep discovering the advantages of uh, working online and uh, offering hybrid services, services that are blended between online and offline. One of the areas where RAN could really support practitioners would be to consider recruiting and bringing people in, perhaps from the tech sector, um, and perhaps people who have already got some, um, who've got skills, who are already working in this space, that can help to really develop confidence and comfort amongst practitioners in how they can go about um, tackling these issues in the future. Because we know that inherently practitioners will have the skills, they'll have the knowledge, they'll have the understanding um, of these ideologies, of these challenges, of these issues, of how to work with people. But actually it's how do we then translate that and transfer that into that onto those digital platforms. So it's, it's so important that we continue to, you know, share our approaches and, and practices and successes with one another. And RAN is clearly a platform that can enable us to, to do that. Um, but maybe, you know, we have to invite more people into the conversation from, for example, the tech and, and the private sector. But I really want to say thank you to my, my wonderful guests for providing such illuminating insights into a very complex and, and difficult subject. Uh, so thank you, Angela Antonova. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kelly Simcock, for, for contributing with your amazing knowledge today. Lovely to meet you. Take care. And finally, a big thank you to all of you guys for, for listening. And I really do hope you can join me next time for the next episode of the RAN in Focus podcast brought to you by RAN Practitioners.